The content of this program represents the opinions, research, and observation of the host and his assessment of scientific evidence available at this time. None of the statements, claims, techniques, dietary guidelines, or supplements mentioned in this program have been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. The information contained herein is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for standard care provided by medical practitioners. Any application of the advice presented here is at the listener's own discretion or risk. The information should not be used for self-diagnosis or application. Always consult a qualified healthcare professional before beginning any new nutritional exercise or lifestyle improvement program. The host and this station disclaim any responsibility for any adverse effects arising from the use or application of information contained in this program. Now broadcasting from his nutritional command center deep in the heart of Victoria, Texas, charging through the swamp of misconceptions, deception, and myths, bringing to you the newest cutting-edge scientific-based nutrition information so you can enjoy whole-spectrum health, here's the paladin of nutrition and whole Whole Foods expert, Labron Allen. From deep in the heart of FEMA Region 6, otherwise known as South Central Texas, I'm your host, Labron Allen, and this is Health Alert. In health news this morning, from Fox News, the American Psychiatric Association scam. Well, what is the American Psychiatric Association cooking up this time? Well, they seem to be employing working groups to create diagnostic codes for insurance claims. In plain words, they're using working groups in order to come up with more quote-unquote disorders that people can be diagnosed with. For example, some of these things that they've come up with will be that people who are grieving or people who are shy can now be labeled with certain disorders and therefore collect insurance on. So that is certainly a way that this American Psychiatric Association can uh, receive a tremendous amount of credibility, don't you think? Next in health news, headline, Big Pharma wants to run medical experiments on your babies. Now what this is about is that, as you probably know, the FDA, before it approves a drug, uh, makes the pharmaceutical companies demonstrate through different kinds of drug trials on humans that their drugs are supposedly, quote-unquote, safe. That's supposed to be the entire idea behind the FDA approved, which we all know that certainly means the drugs are quite safe. That's why in a 30-second pharmaceutical commercial, about 25 seconds of it are the horrible side effects, including death, that most of them will create. But continuing on, the article that was just published in the Journal of Pediatrics by Henry Ackaby who is a medical doctor, and his colleagues from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in the University of Cincinnati. Actually, the study is calling for Big Pharma to work with academics to conduct more human drug tests on a very special group. And what is that very special group? Why, newborn babies, of course. I mean, certainly, newborn babies are the perfect candidates to uh, test out new pharmaceutical drugs. The argument is that children, especially neonates, are an underrepresented population. So see, the entire idea is to help these underrepresented populations out. So therefore, we really need to test these unproven, unsafe drugs on newborn babies. The study goes on to say that out of more than 120,000 studies at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Trials Repository, only about 0.6% involved neonates. Well, isn't that terrible? In total, only 3.4% of all registered pediatric studies involve newborns. Well, certainly that must change immediately. Dr. Akinibi continues to argue that uh, there's many factors to blame, such as extra regulations required to experiment on children. Well, that's horrible, isn't it? Certainly, those should just be done away with. There's no adult equivalents of many newborn health problems to give researchers a starting point for various types of drugs. Well, certainly we need to create the environment so that newborns have uh, very similar diseases as adults do to really render that issue obsolete. Also, he blames a unique physiology of newborns and, of course, not enough financial incentives for pharmaceutical companies to use this special underrepresented group. The result, this doctor and his team write, is that many physicians prescribe adult-approved drugs for children in off-label and unapproved uses. 
and without any clinical trials at all. So certainly it would be better to experiment other newborn babies. The safety of this practice is often unknown and could obviously be placing newborns at risk. However, the experiments of drugs certainly wouldn't be placing the newborns at risk. So the authors of the journal Pediatrics Commentary write, the answer is for the drug industry to work with academics, to come up with study designs for newborns and for more funds, of course, to test more drugs on these babies. Now, obviously, we do not want sick or otherwise fragile newborns to receive medical care, uh, to not receive the medical care. The idea of increasing the number of drug tests on babies is rather worrisome for many different reasons. Uh, For example, the discovery of bogus drug trials results uh, that have been used to push dangerous drugs. Certainly, uh, that would be potential with this particular underrepresented group as well. No one knows for sure how often this particular thing happens as far as the bogus drug trials because what happens is is that we really only hear about the instances where Big Pharma is caught and usually prosecuted for it. So how many times are they not caught do those bogus drug trials continue on? For example, last summer the U.S. Justice Department fined a giant drug manufacturer, GlaxoSmithKline, Uh, The fine was $3 billion to resolve a federal criminal and civil inquiries arising from the company's illegal promotion of some of its products and failure to report safety issues, including the hidden fact that diabetes drug Avandia increases substantially the risk of congestive heart failure and heart attack. So there you have it, folks. A new underrepresented group certainly needs to have drug trials. We need to start using newborn babies to experiment drugs on. Next headline, court ruling. Mobile and cordless phones cause brain tumors. Now, this is the very first time that a a trial of its kind has actually been ruled by the Supreme Court. So for the first time, a Supreme Court has ruled that using mobile and cordless phones is directly linked to causing brain tumors. Let me repeat that because it's very important. A Supreme Court has ruled that using mobile and cordless phones is directly linked to causing brain tumors. Let me repeat that one more time. A Supreme Court has ruled that using mobile and cordless phones is directly linked to causing brain tumors tumors, which affirms what many scientists have been saying for many years about the dangers of cell phone radiation. According to the United Kingdom's Telegraph, reports that 60-year-old Innocente Marceloni, who developed a tumor in his trigeminal nerve, was ruled to have suffered this fate as a direct result of using his mobile handset for up to six hours every day for 12 years. According to Italy's Supreme Court in Rome, there is a causal link between Marceloni's mobile phone use and the non-cancerous tumor that caused the entire left side of his face to become paralyzed. A respected oncologist and professor of environmental mutagenesis, Dr. Angelo Gino Levis, along with neurosurgeon Dr. Giuseppe Grasso, provided evidence at a recent trial showing that the electromagnetic radiation emitted from mobile and cordless phones damages cells. Dr. Marceloni goes on to say, This is significant for very many people. I wanted this problem to become public because many people still do not know the risks. I recognized it. Uh, Rather, I wanted it recognized that there was a link between my illness and the use of mobile phones and cordless phones, he added, noting that he now has to take the extremely powerful painkiller morphine every single day just to cope with his agony. Along the same lines, last year, the World Health Organization ruled that mobile phone devices are a possible human carcinogen and added them to the Class 2B carcinogens list. Also earlier this year, researchers out of Washington 
also came forward with research showing that cell phone radiation causes significant damage to DNA, which can lead to cancer. In the 2007 Life Extension Magazine report, Sue Kovach wrote, Today, there are more than 2 billion cell phone users being exposed every day to the dangers of electromagnetic radiation. Dangers government regulators and the cell phone industry refuse to admit exist. Included are genetic damage, brain dysfunction, brain tumors, and other conditions such as sleep disorders and headaches. So at the very least, folks, don't keep your cell phones, mobile phones, uh, mobile devices, wireless laptops, cordless phones in your bedroom where you sleep for a long time period of time, hopefully. And of course, if you're having problems with sleeping or other health issues, you know what to do. You need to get on a health improvement program. And the simplest way of doing that is to get a, an initial consultation to find if you are truly a nutritional case or not. And if you are, there is nothing that will help you more with your health concerns than a natural health improvement program. This next bit of news from the American Academy of Pediatrics, a clinical report, headline, Organic Foods, Health and Environmental Advantages and Disadvantages. This is what the abstract says. The U.S. market for organic foods has grown from $3.5 billion in 1996 to a whopping $28.6 billion in 2010, according to the Organic Trade Association. Organic products are now sold in specialty stores and conventional supermarkets. Organic products contain numerous marketing claims and terms, only some of which are standardized and regulated. It goes on to say in this abstract, in terms of health advantages, organic diets have been convincingly demonstrated to expose consumers to fewer pesticides associated with human disease. Organic farming has been demonstrated to have less environmental impact than conventional approaches. However... Of course, there's always a but, right? So here it is. However, current evidence does not support any meaningful nutritional benefits or deficits from eating organic compared with conventionally grown foods. And there are no well-powered human studies that directly demonstrate health benefits or disease protection as a result of consuming an organic diet. Studies also have not demonstrated any detrimental or disease-promoting effects from an organic diet. Although organic foods regularly command a significant price premium, well-designed farming studies demonstrate that costs can be competitive and yields comparable to those of conventional farming techniques. Pediatricians should incorporate this evidence when discussing the health and environmental impact of organic foods and organic farming while continuing to encourage all patients and their families to attain optimal nutrition and dietary variety consistent with U.S. Department of Agriculture's MyPlate recommendations. So what this study tries to do is leave you thinking that, you know what, there's really no difference between conventional and organic foods. But you know what? If you are left with that impression, then you have been very, very well deceived, which is exactly what they want this result of the clinical report to do. So let me bring your attention to something specific that they say in this clinical report. Again, I repeat, in terms of health advantages, organic diets have been convincingly demonstrated to expose consumers to fewer pesticides associated with human disease. That is the first sentence. But then the rest of the abstract goes on to talk about how it really doesn't seem to have any difference in nutrition and it doesn't really seem to have anything to do with differences in farming and so on and so on and so on. That's how they conclude the abstract, which leads one, as I said earlier, to believe that there's really not much difference between conventional and or organic. However, they point blank say that there is significantly less chemical exposure of pesticides in organic foods. And remember that this clinical report is in the Journal of Pediatrics. So the idea is that it doesn't really matter 
how much chemical exposure these infants get. It doesn't really matter if you feed them conventional foods or organic foods. But we know that isn't true. We've gone through study after study about how these pesticides actually cause mutations within human genes, within animal genes, genetic mutations. Certainly, that in itself is a total reason to completely avoid regularly produced foods and consume certified organic. Headline, CDC brazenly tries to poison all pregnant women with whooping cough vaccines that we know don't even work. The article goes on to say the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which makes formal recommendations to the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention about vaccine guidelines, recently decided that all pregnant women should be vaccinated for whooping cough, also known as pertussis. Totally defying up-to-date science showing that the vaccine does not even work, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices voted 14 to 0 to make it official U.S. government policy that pregnant women receive the jab in order to supposedly pass on immunity to their babies. This sudden policy change follows a similar decision by the U.K.'s National Health Service to begin pushing pregnant Britons to get vaccinated for whooping cough as well, which is the only vaccine besides influenza that health authorities now recommend for pregnant women. It also comes about one year after ACIP made a contradictory recommendation to begin administering the vaccine during pregnancy only to women who had not previously been vaccinated for the disease. Since very few women, fewer than 3%, followed through with the CDC's earlier recommendations, the agency apparently decided to kick things up a gear by recommending that all women, regardless of vaccination status, receive a Tdap booster shot, which contains antigens for tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. This recommendation comes despite the fact that the whooping cough vaccine admittedly does not provide lasting protection against the disease. Does that make any sense to you? So this morning, I wanted to discuss a very old, very effective form of natural remedy that's been used for at least 250 years. It was created by a medical doctor, a German medical doctor, and this form or category of natural remedy is known as homeopathy, and the specific remedies are known as homeopathics. So homeopathy, as I said, it got its start about 250 years ago in Germany. Dr. Samuel Hahnemann was the medical doctor who created homeopathics, and here's what he did. So first of all, in orthodox traditional medicine, uh, even that we use to this day, the idea is, is that you have an ill patient and they, let's say, have a headache. And so what you do is you um, give them a pain medication to suppress the effects of that headache. And that's how medicine has worked now for centuries. Now what Dr. Hahnemann did is when he had an ill patient, he would take a person who is perfectly healthy and he would begin giving this perfectly healthy individual substances until he induced let's say in the same example, the exact same symptoms of a headache within this well person as the ill person was experiencing. Now, once he found this one substance that would induce these exact same kind of symptoms, he would take that substance and he would dilute it so that the substance was very, very minute in this tincture. And then he would take that tincture and give it to the person who was ill, who was suffering from those particular symptoms. And as the ill person took that homeopathic, it would uh, create an immunological reaction or response, and the person would begin feeling well. 
So that is the basic ideas behind homeopathy. Now, why did he call it homeopathy? Well, homeopathy uh, is actually coined from Latin words homeoin, which means similar, and pathine, which means disease or suffering. So it means similar suffering. So what, again, that means is that he would use a person who is healthy, give them substances until he found the one that induced similar suffering or similar symptoms within that person. Now, Dr. Hahnemann used or, or also coined a law regarding homeopathy, and that was like cures like. So how exactly does homeopathy work? Well, homeopathy, as I just said, works based upon the law of similars, the idea of like curing like. A homeopathic remedy is really simply a dilution of one or several plant, mineral, or animal substances. It could be animal tissues or animal glands, uh, even different forms of animal pathologies like disease tissue, depending on what needs to be done. Now, these substances are diluted until either none or very, very little of the original substance remains at all. It is important to note that in homeopathy, it's really the energetic signal, like electromagnetic frequency, rather than the substance, which is considered to have the healing effect. Okay, so in homeopathy, it isn't the substance that's considered to have the healing effect. That's medicine. That's allopathic medicine. It is the electromagnetic signal, frequency, similar, that is thought to have the healing effect. The interesting thing about homeopathy is, is that the weakest dilutions are actually considered to be the most potent. So in plain words, in homeopathy, there's like 1X, 1M, 1C. Uh, in a 1X dilution, that's not nearly as strong as a 250X or a 500X. A 500X is much, much more potent in homeopathy, which means there's much, 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 much less of the original substance in that particular remedy than there is in a 1X, for example. Now, the higher the homeopathic uh, potency goes, so you have 1x, 10x, 50x, 100x, 200, 300, 400, 500, the higher it goes, the more it is thought to work on a very, very deep cellular level. The application of homeopathic principle is, unfortunately, <laughs> if you wish to say, very similar to the idea of a vaccination, although it is a very different process. When ingested, the homeopathic remedy actually signals the body. Remember, I said earlier, that it is the frequency, the electromagnetic frequency of the homeopathic remedy that has the effect. So when you ingest the homeopathic, it is the homeopathic remedy signal that actually elicits the body's natural immune response. And that's what leads towards internal balance, also known as homeostasis, and hopefully the restoration of your health. So, for example, uh, you've probably had poison ivy or po poison oak. It creates a rash. It itches. But when elements of poison ivy are prepared and administered as a homeopathic remedy, they can actually help the body overcome exactly the same symptoms because of the law that Dr. Hahnemann created, like cures like. Now, that doesn't mean you go out and pull off a poison ivy or poison oak leaf and rub it all over your body when you have a poison ivy or poison oak rash. No, the the tinctures, the homeopathic remedies, have to be prepared in a very special way. 
So the question is, how will you benefit from using homeopathy? Well, there's actually numerous benefits of utilizing homeopathy as part of an overall health improvement program. So here's a few. They are extremely gentle and effective. They are completely safe for uh, pregnant nursing mothers, infants, use them very commonly on infants because they're very, very gentle. Uh, you can all even use them on animals. They're safe for elderly individuals and everyone in between. It has a long history of efficacy. It's backed by over 200 years of research and application. They can assist the body in resolving ailments at even a causative level, not just suppression of symptoms. They really complement the innate healing ability of your body. The remedies are very easy to take. Uh, they're oftentimes pleasant tasting. So every person's health and healing process is obviously unique. That's the idea of a health improvement program and using a designed clinical nutrition program. Designed clinical nutrition means that whatever you take is specifically for you in your biochemistry, and it is no different if your health improvement program contains some homeopathic remedies. Now, here are the specific different types of homeopathics. They are actually in different categories, okay? So first of all, there are homeopathics that are called no-sewed detoxifiers. Now, what no-sewed detoxifiers do is that they encourage the body to release toxins that are deep within the cells. So we are talking about a cellular detoxification. Let me repeat that because it's very important. These no-so detoxifier homeopathics detoxify the body on a cellular level. A cellular level. Now, why I stress that is, is that everyone who runs out and does cleanses and detoxification systems, uh, regardless of what system it is, they are not cleansing themselves on a cellular, on a tissue level. They're cleansing themselves on an organ level. Okay? They're hopefully flushing out their colon or flushing out their liver or flushing out and, and cleansing their kidneys. That is not necessarily doing anything on a cellular level. It can, but usually it isn't. So the next category of homeopathics are actually drainage and tonification remedies. Now, drainage doesn't mean it's going to make your nose run or sinuses drip. That's not the kind of drainage. What they are actually for are to help organs drain and tone, but not only organs, but also glands and tissues as well. Specific glands, organs, and tissues can be targeted through uh, homeopathic drainage and tonification remedies. The next category is called SAR codes. Now, SAR codes supply the body with a blueprint, with a plan of healthy tissue from which the body can take that information and rebuild the tissue, rebuild the organ, rebuild the gland. So like if there is an autoimmune disease and person has tissue destruction of a certain gland like Hashimoto's, it can be possible for the body to utilize that information from a SAR code and actually start rebuilding that gland, perhaps. The next category of homeopathics are called flower essences. These are based on the research of Dr. Edward Bach. You may have also heard of Bach flower essences. That's what these are based upon, but these are potentiatized. They are much more powerful than Bach flower remedies. Basically, what these uh, flower essences do is promote emotional stability, balance, and renewal. You see, in healing... There are categories of things that interfere with the body's ability to heal, and I've discussed this before, but I'm going to run through it just briefly now. Those categories of things are, of course, food allergies, and that would also include processed foods that are anti-nutrients, infections, heavy metals, chemicals, scarring on the surface of the skin, electromagnetic pollution, and emotional stress or demand on the body. <clears throat> so 
So flower essences can be used to help eradicate that emotional stress. So homeopathics are very, very powerful remedies that can be used to catapult your health and reach your optimal health goals. And those are just one of the things that we use in health improvement programs. We use a wide array of different things to help your body return back to its original state of health. Now, our next free health presentation is going to be held Tuesday, November the 13th. That's Tuesday, November the 13th at 7 p.m. At the same location, that's at the Natural Health Clinic at 3908 John Stockbauer, Suite C in Victoria, Texas. The title of this free health presentation will be Where's My Mojo? Loss of Libido and Sexual Satisfaction. You have no idea how many patients that I see that this is a common problem. They simply have no libido any longer, and they don't know how to get it back. And really, that does impede a true long-term quality of life. And so this free health presentation will go into the reasons why this occurs, and uh, just as importantly, if not more importantly, what you can do to increase your sexual desire. There are many different things that are involved in a loss of libido. Certainly, there can be hormonal imbalances in both genders, not just women, in both genders responsible for this. Obviously, erectile dysfunction can have many reasons. It can be a sign of overall physical illness, or it can be a sign of emotional issue, emotional stress, uh, circulation difficulties, or... Our hormonal problem. Also, it's becoming more and more common that men are suffering from something called andropause, which is like menopause for women, except with men, it does not happen at a particular time necessarily, at a particular age. You know, with women, once they reach 50, 55, 57, uh, they're going to pretty much enter menopause. However, a man can actually be in andropause shortly after puberty and not even know it. They simply will not have the drive, the motivation, the ambition, the success in their life that they should have otherwise enjoyed because their hormonal system, their endocrine system is not giving them what they need. So to some degree, we will also talk about this particular issue in this upcoming free health presentation. This is something not to be missed. This is very good, very interesting information. Uh, It shocks me that persons of all ages, I mean, you think that a young individual is going to have uh, a good libido and very often they complain about that they do not. Um, And that can really, especially when you're married, create problems for either gender. So again, this free health presentation entitled, Where's My Mojo? Loss of Libido and Sexual Satisfaction will be held Tuesday, November the 13th at 7 p.m., In our clinic, the Natural Health Clinic, located at 3908 John Stockbauer, you need to RSVP. Uh, We just held our last free health presentation uh, last Tuesday, and we had no seats available. There was only standing room left, so please RSVP if you wish to have a seat for this free health presentation. You do that simply by calling area code 361 575 Four six eight three, and tell Tanya that you want to RSVP for the next free health seminar. Now, here is the advantage. You know that you need to get healthy. You know that there is so much conflicting information that you need help in deciphering what needs to be done. Would you not like a laser-sharp, laser-accurate guide as to what your body needs in order to regain health. Wouldn't you like to know what is interfering with your body's natural ability to regain health? Well, that is what a natural health improvement program does for you. Now, typically, uh, initial consultation, that is the first step to getting on a health improvement program, will cost you $147. However, if you come to a free health seminar, then you will be 
able to receive a completely free initial consultation. An initial consultation at no charge. Now to learn exactly how that happens, you need to attend the next free health seminar, which one more time is going to be held Tuesday, November the 13th at 7 p.m. Well, we went over a lot of information today. I hope that you found the information about homeopathics helpful and interesting. They are very powerful, very, very powerful ways of increasing your health and helping your body to eliminate interferences to its return to optimal health. So until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for tuning in to Health Alert.